Welcome to the Internet Report, where we uncover what's working and what's breaking on the internet and why. I say we, but I'm flying solo this week, which is just as well because we have a lot to cover today. There were two major incidents last week. One of them was application related. So that was where Microsoft had a significant disruption that lasted approximately three hours. And we also had an internet related issue. So this was yet another BGP mishap involving Telstra, which we'll also talk about today. So a little bit of application, a little bit of network, for those of you who are curious about the Slack incident that happened this Monday, we'll be covering that next week. So just to jump right into the Microsoft incident, go to uh, take a look at what we saw as this went down. So we're looking here, you see kind of looking at availability to Microsoft and specifically login.microsoftonline.com, which is the front door to Azure AD, the mechanism or the service that's used to access um, Office 365, Azure services, and other Microsoft services. We'll talk a little bit about Azure AD in a moment. But you can see here that during the course of the incident, when availability dipped pretty significantly, you can see that uh, there's a lot of locations that are receiving 503 service unavailable errors, indicating the service is down. Um, and then also we're getting receive errors, so we're getting some timeouts as well, well during the, this particular incident. And what's interesting here, as you can see, is that it looks like North America or the Americas, as well as Australia, were most impacted, which uh, aligns with Microsoft's own uh, description of the, the scope, which um, we'll look at in just a moment. So, the incident unfolded around 2.25 uh, p.m. Pacific time, so 21.25 UTC. So here we can see um, the, the beginnings of this. Um, we're getting one kind of connect error here. And then very quickly, service starts to degrade and more and more users are just simply not able to use the service. And, you know, this lasted again um, about three hours, which is pretty significant given that this is happening uh, early in the afternoon uh, for uh, at least for uh, the western part of uh, the US. So, um, you know, that's kind of what we saw from an, from an impact standpoint. And again, if we look at Azure's statement on uh, users that were impacted, we can see that, you know, what we saw kind of aligns with that. So only 17% of uh, users uh, within U the U.S. were able to successfully authenticate during the incident. Um, Australia was also low, so around 37%, um, whereas Europe and uh, Asia, not too bad, so 81%, 72 during during uh, uh, the duration of the, the incident. And they identified Azure Active Directory as the root cause. So this is what Microsoft uses uh, uh, primarily for identity and authentication. And a lot of third-party web apps also, or applications also use that uh, particular service to map users, um, in the case of Microsoft, to their particular subscription, their instances, and their data. It's kind of like a um, first step before you're even able to access um, applications like Office 365. So you can almost think about this as like DNS. If DNS doesn't work, you're not getting to uh, your desired destination. And if Azure AD is not able to identify or authenticate you, then you're not getting to um, Office 365. And that's what was happening here. Um, what's really interesting is the sort of the sequence of interactions that's required to get an authenticated page. Um, it's not just um, kind of a one and done where you're, you're directed to Azure AD. There's quite a few different interaction points in the sign-in flow. And that means that any one of these particular um, interactions could be uh, uh, the, uh, a, a potential point of failure. So for example, if I'm trying to reach office.com, I may go to my uh, web browser, type in office.com. I'm gonna connect to Office 365 web app. Um, they're going to look to see if I'm already authenticated. If, I'm, if I am, I'm gonna get my docs and my account details. But if I'm not, they're gonna uh, redirect me to Azure AD. And then Azure AD is gonna serve up an authentication page. I have to go through a series of steps to authenticate. And then finally, 
uh, Azure AD will send a token to, to the web app and then that web app will revalidate. So there's a pretty significant series of interactions that needs to occur in order to successfully gain access to um, the application that I want to reach. And so what was interesting was that during the course of the incident, yes, we were seeing 503s. So, um, you know, effectively the, um, the application was was simply breaking here. So the redirect to Azure AD was just getting back a service unavailable. But other points during the incident, as we can see here, users were able to successfully load parts of the login page and even attempt to log in. So we were getting, for example, as you can see here, on attempting to log in, so we were able to successfully load the page, um, we were getting an error indicating that there was a backend issue with Azure AD. So um, different behaviors were, were showing that different parts of the service were unavailable um, during the incident. Now, I think, you know, what's interesting about that, if we go back to when uh, users were successfully able to sign on, we can see, for instance, and let's go ahead and expand this. We can see all of the various components that need to work and need to um, be, be successfully served up in order for the user to have a good experience. And what's particularly interesting here is you can see, okay, so we're redirected uh, from office.com to login.microsoftonline.com, which is Azure AD's front door. And then um, once that happens, we um, start to get a variety of components that are served up from, in this case, we have uh, Verizon EdgeCast, uh, which is kind of front-ending parts, parts of ID. And then we also have, um, uh, for example, Akamai and even Microsoft themselves. So multiple providers involved, many different components that need to be served up. Um, and that really just speaks to the complexity of modern applications. Um, you go to a login page, uh, your experience is kind of, of a, something that's monolithic, but underneath the hood, there's this um, multiplicity of services and providers and components that all need to successfully work together in order to provide that experience. And then there's also a lot of um, services on the back end, like API calls that need to work um, in order to serve up applications. So it's important to understand kind of what your dependencies are. And a transaction test is, is useful in kind of showing you um, all of the different pieces that make up, of an, um, up an application. Um, and the providers that are um, that you're reliant on. So that was the Azure um, Active Directory incident. Now moving on to the Telstra routing incident. So this was this happened on Tuesday, and uh, apparently uh, Telstra began announcing uh, 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 routes to services that did not belong to it. So there was um, services like, for example, Proton Mail. Um, they were announcing uh, one of their uh, slash 24s. And um, also, for example, we see Quad9 that indicated that some of their prefixes were being announced by Telstra. Now, Telstra um, did say that uh, they didn't see a lot of traffic being routed to them as a result of that. Um, so they said that um, their systems indicated that negligible traffic was actually received. Um, I mean, negligible is sort of a, a, um, a matter of perspective. Telstra is a very large service provider, and if you were a customer of ProtonMail or Quad9, uh, you may have felt very differently about it. Um, so. In terms of Quad9 and what we saw with their services, so here, this is kind of during normal state. Um, Quad9 is announcing a slash 24. So we can see that they're the origin. And then here we can see that there's a path change or, or um, a, a different path that's being introduced. And we see that uh, Telstra comes into the mix. And they're also the origin. Right? So they're announcing the same, they're also announcing a slash 24. And then here, we can see something pretty interesting, which is now there are two origins for this particular prefix. So we have quad nine and we have Telstra, um, which is um, really interesting because in a lot of hijacking scenarios that we see, we see that what happens is that the, um, 
the responsible party, so the hijacker, whether intentional or not, will start announcing a more specific prefix. So this has happened, for instance, with Cloudflare, where they announce a slash 20. And then um, in the case of uh, uh, the recent hijacking with Ross Telecom, Ross Telecom accidentally, uh, because of a route leak, started announcing a slash 21. So in that case, that's going to be the preferred route because that's a more specific announcement. And so that just steered a whole bunch of traffic to Ross Telecom, which got dropped. Now, in this case, Telstra is not announcing a more specific prefix. They're announcing the same uh, uh, prefix. Uh, so the slash 24 that you see here. Now, quad nine, um, you know, typically a, a, a way to mitigate the impact of a hijacking would be to then announce an even more specific prefix. Although in this case, because quad nine was announcing a slash 24, and that's um, often the smallest announcement that many service providers will accept, um, there wasn't a whole lot that could have been done here. They could have announced a couple of slash 25s, but that's not really a practical um, uh, thing to have done to mitigate the, the damage here. And the damage we can see was pretty profound. So if we go up to the network view here, we can see that about 25% of the traffic um, that was flowing to its services here is um, suffering loss. So this is a good map view here. We can see the DNS server availability and we can see it's really only um, about, you know, 75, 77% 70, uh, um, globally impacted. Um, it's not impacting everybody, but it's, it's, um, it is impacting a pretty sizable um, chunk of its users. And so if we go back to the network view, we can see this massive packet loss. And if we just zero in on, let's say, let's go to San Jose um, connected to Verizon, we can see that traffic is going from Verizon to Telstra. So uh, Telstra in San Jose, and then traffic gets redirected to Australia, and then eventually it gets black holed, right? So all traffic gets dropped. And so we were seeing that for a number of different locations, um, but in particular, uh, Verizon. And one of the reasons for that, if we go back to the BGP route view, is that um, it looks like even though um, both Quad9 and Telstra were announcing uh, the same prefix, that Quad9 was still the preferred um, uh, route for most of uh, the providers. So they were still kind of being preferred throughout this incident, um, but some of the routes were, uh, were being preferred uh, for Telstra, and one of them was, if we go a little bit, uh, we can see this here, that Verizon accepted uh, Telstra's announcement of Quad 9's uh, prefix. So that, um, if you're a Verizon customer, um, whether a commercial customer or business customers um, using one of their business uh, services, you, you probably would have been more likely impacted um, by this particular incident. And we can see here that, you know, throughout um, this, this incident, there were periods in which the announcements were, were kind of changing and fluctuating. Um, but then after, um, so we can see here, uh, Telstra is finally revoking the illegitimate route. And then later on, we can see that everything has been restored. And now we just have quad nine as the origin, which is, which is as it should be. So that was a particularly interesting one, because when we see hijackings, we typically see a more specific announcement. And that typically has a, uh, a much bigger impact. Um, and I think this is probably one of the first ones that I've seen where there's basically two origins um, because two, two ASs are announcing um, the same uh, uh, prefix. So um, very interesting incident. You can see kind of the impact of that, not 100%, um, but, but you know, 25% of uh, traffic um, in this particular example. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, this just really kind of speaks to, again, some, a topic that's come up 
which is BGP security and specifically around RPKI and adoption of that and really the need to, to have better um, internet security hygiene, if you will. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and close out the show. As I mentioned, we're going to cover the Slack incident that happened this week next week. Um, so be sure to uh, tune in for that. That will be a really interesting one. And uh, again, if you have questions or comments, um, or if you have ideas of what we could cover on a future episode, drop us a line at internetreport at thousandeyes.com and uh, subscribe. Uh, we're on YouTube. We're also on various podcast platforms. And if you do subscribe, we will uh, send you a t-shirt. So subscribe and then send us an email with your uh, t-shirt size and address and we'll send you uh, send that right out to you. So with that, have a good week and take care.